Thanks very much, guys. It's a um, it's a real pleasure to to be here and to have the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, before we kick off, I actually wanted to say a massive thanks to a few people. Um, Mike and Koshik, what an incredible, rich tapestry of human experience we've all been able to share. Thank you guys for having a few seconds of, um, of, of, of our lives. I also want to thank Leah and Simone. Um, I met these guys at a festival a couple of months ago and they're dedicated to creating connections. And in a world uh, and in a, in a society that is struggling through lack of connection, situations like this um, where we can actually meet and tell our stories and share our experiences, this is what we need more of. So thanks very much to you guys for putting this yes. on. Um, and, and for the opportunity to speak as well and share my story. As, um, as Leah mentioned, I am um, a filmmaker, a photographer, and on the weekends I jump on a big red fire truck. Um, at the end of the 2019-2025 season, which I'll be talking a lot about tonight, um, I struggled to wrap my head around the enormity of the experience. Um, that's a good time. Um, wrap my head around the enormity of the experience and Given I always had a camera with me, and you know, it wasn't we weren't that far into the season before I realised that um, you know this was this was an historic thing that was going on. I um, processed a lot of uh, my response and my reaction to this experience by making a little film just about my experience. And there's something about wrapping it, wrapping the experience up into a narrative, which I think is helpful in um, at least it was for me so I could try and make sense of the experience. So I thought I'd, um, I'd start by showing, showing that film and then I'll uh, spin a couple of yarns about some of the stuff that's come from it as well. I wanted to tell people what was happening to me and what I'd seen. 
for anyone's family, family and friends, who I'm sure we're already worried enough. Check the house. Hey. So I kept it to myself. The firefighters themselves, who feel so deflated, hold on, hold on. Who, who feel such sadness and despair at seeing so much loss. We got, we got, we got. We've got to make sure we take stock of the extraordinary effort that's been achieved in saving us so much. The emotional impact on the firefighters has been profound. When I reflect on how the fires have changed my life, and as we honour the memory of all those we have lost, yeah, I've dropped a few tears. Not because I'm broken, but because I'm proud to have been a part of all that we were able to save. Unified in intent, unified in purpose, unified in focus to serve and protect their local community. Experiences can be as important as and as profound in creating human connection um, and creating those things that I feel like society is lacking a bit uh, at the moment. A big theme of my talk is how, profi- how profound the impact can be uh, in sharing these experiences. Um, just so you know, I've just got a running slideshow of uh, some of my photography um, over the course of the last couple of years, uh, mainly from the from the, the big season, um, but some other some other fires as well. This topic can actually be a difficult one for me to talk about. Um, when I sat down to start preparing for the talk, there was a moment where I was just like, okay, so we're going into, we're wandering in some territory here. But I, despite when I think the difficulty and the challenges that we face and what we've seen, that was just part of it. Like, you know, and, and I could work through that pretty quickly. Um, the main reason why it's a difficult thing to talk about is that. And the reason why when I first released that film, one of the things I felt a little bit uncomfortable about is that it's all about my experiences and it's all about me. Um, That's something that not many people that I know in the RFS are comfortable doing and talking about. We are a volunteer fire service. We all work together. There's no individual... um, There's there's, there's, there's no, no individuality to it all. So... It can, it can be a little bit of a difficult thing to talk about um, for that reason, and also, uh, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to come across as being self-aggrandizing or look at me, look what I've done. That's obviously not the intent of what we're doing here. And I was reminded of a good friend of mine, Sue, earlier on tonight. I told her about this. You know, people are here and hear really your story. So this is going to be very much my opinions, my experiences. They don't reflect the service necessarily. Um, and if any of you know other fires who have different experiences, I'm sure they will and have different interpretations of those experiences. So um, I appreciate that uh, you'll indulge me in just sort of sharing more specifics about um, some of what I've seen and some of the stuff that doesn't actually get, um, get so much reported. In writing this uh, and preparing for this talk, I tried to um, imagine what it is that this audience would want to hear and have shaped, shaped the talk around that. Starting with, I'm going to start talking a bit about what it's like in the middle of a terrifying bushfire, what it's like beyond the roadblocks, um, what that experience looks like, sounds like, feels like, smells like. And then I'm going to talk a bit about what we do to train ourselves to be able to operate under these trying conditions. How do we actually deal with the stress and chaos of these uh, intense situations? The story I want to tell about some of the communities uh, and the communities that we um, that we work with and help protect, and um, there's some an untold number of uh, experiences about 
the enormous amount of strength and, uh, and, and resilience on display in those communities. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about post-traumatic stress, um, which has obviously become a very, very publicised area um, in, this, in this field. Um, and then I'm going to give a little bit of insight about why we do it. As a volunteer organisation, why are we putting ourselves in these, in these situations? Um, and I think some of them might, might surprise you a little bit as well. I'm also very glad to have an opportunity for a Q&A at the end, so if there's anything that you guys want to talk about or know about that I haven't covered off or that I've missed out, I'm, I'm really glad. I'm actually really looking forward to the Q&A. Um, I'd love to hear some of your guys' thoughts and questions on that, and I'll answer them as best I can. In, uh, on 7th of February 2019 was the 10th anniversary of the Black Saturday fires that took place in Victoria. For those of you who remember, Black Saturday was the most devastating um, bushfire in terms of loss of human life in, in this country's history. Over the course of a day or two, 173 lives were lost in the bushfires. And as you can imagine, they did not die well. In celebration of the 10 year anniversary of uh, Black Saturday, uh, I caught a rerun of a documentary that had been made about that tragedy. Um, I don't think I've ever seen anything that's shaken me up as much as that film. Um, not only the stories of the firefighters and the actual, some of the technical stuff that was going on with the fires, but some of the way, and I add off to the filmmakers, the way they were able to tell the stories of immense incalculable tragedy and loss um, was something that had a really profound impact on me. There were two things that, I, that came from that, from that, from the experience of watching that film and considering and thinking about Black Saturday. The first thing was, when shit goes down, the safest place to be is the back of a fire truck. There's, like, that was just one thing that, that actually gave me, some, gave me some comfort. The second realisation or thought that I had as a result of considering the Black Saturday fires was that if I am ever in a situation where things are kicking off as badly as they were at Black Saturday, or as badly as they ended up doing less than a year later, or six months later, I had the resolve, I had the thought, I had the idea, and made the commitment, the resolution, that when shit goes down like that, I want to be in the middle of it. I want to be on the first truck out there. I want to be the biggest, baddest, worst fire. Now, that was a kind of alarming revelation. Um, and it's not, well, we'll talk a little bit later about why that was, but I had firmly said in my mind that if that happens here, and it's going to, or anything like that, I want to be the first to put my hand up and get, and get involved. What I didn't know at the time is it was only a few days later that a major fire incident took off up in northern New South Wales in a town called Tinga. Actually, there was a complex, there were a number of them around, and the request went out for crews to volunteer to go up on a, on a strike team deployment um, up to that area. And so straight away, I was just like, well, now's your opportunity. And so I put my hand up and we went up to, um, we went up to Tinga, we went to Glen Innes and because Tinga was kicking off much more violently, we got redeployed, we got diverted. And it was there that I saw for the first time in probably about 15 years how ferocious and how aggressive and how dangerous and terrifying and loud a major bushfire event is. Those who were on my crew that day will know of, of the story of the gates of hell. We had just arrived and we were, still size, we were still getting a sense of what this fire was, what the, what the terrain was, what the topography was, how bad it was, how many houses are likely to be lost, our houses are going to be likely to be lost. And as we were just sort of getting our, getting our bearings, familiarising ourselves with the area, a call came over the radio from our strike team leader, who was a former Fire and Rescue New South Wales Commissioner, probably one of the more highly respected um, professional firefighters uh, in the country. He's uh, has always been a part of the RFS as well. He was our striking leader on the radio, he comes over a, a, a red message, which basically means life threatening situation. So, of course, immediately everyone stops. And he says, Call, He's calling in for immediate airstrike. I've lost communication with one of our Cat 1s. They've been over on by fire. Um, 
we need the immediate airstrike, and furthermore, any other available units in the in the vicinity provide immediate assistance. So I looked at where, where their position was and where ours was, and I turned to Keith, my officer in charge next to me, and I said, Keith, that's us, we're the nearest ones. So straight away, lights and signs, with only about a five minute drive. So actually, some of that footage early on in the film, we drive, we're driving through fire, that was on our way to the gates of hell. Upon arriving at the gates of hell, we, and this is why it was called that, it was a rural property in the front boundary had this wall that was about 50 metres long and it was about a waist, waist to chest high. The whole thing was made of disused car tyres. Every single one of those car tyres was raging fire. This whole wall was, um, was, was well ablaze, um, fully involved, is to use uh, uh, technical terms. And if any of, you, any of you have ever seen a car tyre on fire, it spews out a very thick, oily, disgusting, highly toxic black smoke, throws up a huge amount of flame, um, and this was, this was what we were greeted with. Keith Master in charge, who is an extraordinarily experienced firefighter and actually works in engineering at the RFS, so he knows what these trucks can and can't do, barely paused as before driving in. Now, I was in the front seat, and there was smoke everywhere, so visibility was an issue, and part of my role is to make sure to help the driver situational awareness. So as we're driving in, I look to my left, and there's a car light there. So I'm like, car light left, and I look up, there's a bus that's about 10 metres away. Bus light, you know, two o'clock on the right. And there's a demountable building, that's light. And at that point, after calling out three things, I'm like, and I look around, and like, everything's on fire. All the grass, all the bushes, everything. The house, it's all on fire. And one of our units was somewhere in there. Through the smoke, as the gust, the, the, blood, the winds, the gust was just... Um, flapping all over the place, so occasionally you get like a little split second where you get a bit of clarity and a bit of visibility. And through that smoke, you know, we could all see the blue and red flashing lights of the unit we were there to, um, to assist. And I'll never forget Keith sitting next to me, straight away just says, uh, we, we pause, give it a couple of seconds, and we see that truck move towards us. It's about 30 metres away. And he said to me, he said, they're moving, so they're alive. We need to lead them out of here. So we've pulled around, this other unit's coming behind us, and speaking to the driver of that other unit later on, after we, we didn't even know who they, who they were at that point, but they were actually our friends from HQ around the corner, from our brigade. The driver had said that they had been in a tanker protection scenario, which basically means you know, your last resort is to jump into the, jump into the truck, drop the heat shields, um, we have the spray bars that go on. They only had about a quarter of a tank of water, so the spray bars weren't on for that long, and that water had just... Um, they just finished, so they were out of water. At that point, the driver and all the rest of the crew were, I think, understandably in a bit of a panic, and they were realising that they were in a life and death situation. And she had said to me that from that chaos, once, and you know, zero visibility, totally disoriented, and had seen our lights, our red and blue lights, and she said that from that whole enormous uh, enormity of an experience, which is sort of incomprehensible to make heads or tails of it, then it was laser guided focus, and then she, she could see. This is my way out. This is how I'm going. To, this is how I'm going to get the crew out of here. So they pulled in behind us. We were able to lead them out, back through the gates of hell, through that thick oily smoke, um, back onto the road, and then they sort of took off for a debrief and um, and to sort of re regather themselves. The important thing about this story and a lot of the other stories I'm about to tell is that one thing to remember is that this is not normal. I've been in the RFS for uh, over ten years. These situations are extremely rare. 99% of our time is just sort of training, rolling, bowling hoses, doing our scenarios. But for the first time in my life during the 2019-2020 season, these situations were becoming more and more frequent and more and more commonplace. And you start building up this bank of knowledge and experiences from that. In trying to give an idea about what it looks like and feels like, in these hectic situations and in these terrifying situations, it's actually quite difficult because it's not like anything else that I could sort of say, well, you know, you know, when we did that thing, and it's kind of like that. There's nothing that I can sort of compare it to. I can talk about some of the sensory stuff, like, you know, you get a sense from the film about how loud it is in these situations. You've got choppers and aircraft going overhead. You've got the <coughs> fire itself. I mean, you know, you've got a campfire or you've got a, um, you know, you've got a fire at home and just sort of crackling away. Imagine that with something the size of several football fields and the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, volume that that can create. 
But really it's about the adrenaline. Or is it fear? And you don't know, is it adrenaline or fear of one of the two? And it hops you up into a, situ- in a situation where your, your brain operates differently. Survival in- instinct can sometimes kick in. The sensory overload get, it gets to the extent where you don't really know whether you'll fall apart or whether you'll be able to sort of keep your shit together and, and actually be operationally useful. The physical exertion is something that, that um, often gets overlooked. Obviously, it's hot, and when you're, you know, it's hot anyway because it's usually 30 plus degrees and it's dry and it's windy. So the condition, the weather conditions anyway, are not conducive um, to to anything that's remotely comfortable. And then obviously the, the heat of the fire, is this, is this like I'm about to get burnt heat or is this just fire heat? And in the midst you're running, you're carrying hoses, you're sprinting, or you're at the end of a hose and you're holding your breath because of the smoke. And you're holding your breath so you can stay in the fire just a couple of seconds longer and just try and knock down this fire, try and knock this down, down this fire. And your lungs are bursting and you know that you just, you just want to... <laughs> But you know that you can't because you're in the midst of the smoke and if you do that, it's going to burn you. It's going to burn your track. It's going to burn your lungs. So you just hold there for another second and then you look around to try and see where I can go. Where is there clear air? And you duck back, suck on in, suck to right back in. It's these kind of situations that become... that then cloud the, cloud the brain in the way the brain processes and memory processes things. At its worst, it's chaos... Panic and fear ultimately leading to a retreat. At its best, you go with a methodical, almost, you get into a methodical, almost robotic um, state of mind where it's kind of like, it's, it's actually, do you guys, you guys remember the Matrix, first Matrix movie? You know, at the end of the film, when Neo first, re- like when he finally realizes that he's a one, he's got that massive battle sequence, not against, not, not only Agent Smith, but against the other agents. And there's this corridor scene where, He's moving, it's almost like he's moving in slow motion, but everything else around him is moving so quickly. You kind of want to get into that, into that mindset. It's hard, to, it's hard to explain, it's hard to really convey because your memory kind of shuts down a bit as well. Like the details of the memory is becoming a bit fuzzy. I think that's because you go into this sort of survival, survival instinct where your brain prioritises the things that are going to keep you alive and not just keep you alive, but actually keep you making good decisions and perhaps deprioritises memory retool, memory retention. It occurred to me as soon as I wrote that line when I was doing this, it's like, shit, I would have just heard a talk from Dr. Krishit Ram, <laughs> an actual neuroscientist. So if I'm, if I'm wrong, it's, it, that's what it feels like. But I, I think it might be something to do with that. But as I said, these, these are rare situations, but they, they, they did through 2019, 2020, they became more and more frequent. As I said in the film, like I, I, I generally tend not to refer to it as Black Summer because you know we were sort of kicking off in August while well, friends of mine were going off on ski trips. I was going up to Grafton um, to fight fires. Because so much of it was going on further north of New South Wales, I think a lot of, a lot of people's impressions of bushfires are something that it happens over there. It happens far away. And then once it started getting closer to Sydney you know, into November and December, then people started paying a bit more attention, you know, which, is, which is understandable, I, I, I get that. So in the midst of all these sort of chaotic, freak-out kind of moments, um, how do we actually deal with it? How do we actually maintain some kind of uh, ability to do the job we need to do? In my role as deputy captain um, at my brigade, my brigade's up at Belrose and Northern Beaches, for those of you who, uh, who know Sydney well. Um, when I'm training up our crews, most of them, a lot of them, haven't seen a lot of this stuff, so it's really hard to know whether they're, they're going to be able to actually be operationally effective or whether they're just going to freeze up. And during the big season, I did see um, more times that I care to admit that... Um, or more times I would like, that people do sort of sometimes freeze up. So how do we, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we prevent this sensory overload um, and imminent threat from preventing us from, uh, from doing our jobs? And it's something that I think can apply to a lot of things. When you're facing an enormous challenge, you break it down into smaller parts. So as we are responding to an incident, um, usually we get enough information, whether it's a motor vehicle accident, person's trap, or whether it's a structure fire, um, or whether it's a bushfire, um, Usually we know enough on our way 
so that as we're responding lights and sirens to the incident, there's enough time for the crew leader, for the deputy captain, to turn around and, and assign tasks to, to each of the people in the crew. And that's a big part of how we get through these difficult situations. Like, it's like those expressions, you know, journey of, every journey of a thousand leagues begins with a single step. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? By breaking things into specific tasks, I can turn around and say, right, you're on the life reel, you're backing, you're backing her up, I need you to get out the sandpipe. And then you can overcome that sort of emotional response of the enormity of the situation, like this person's trapped or this, you know, we've got 10 metre flame high or we've got whatever, break it down into specific tasks and that sort of helps get through, um, get through those challenges. It takes you what takes you away from uh, takes takes the attention away from the enormity of the challenge. And I, what's tricky about this um, about this stuff, especially in a volunteer organisation where we're not exposed to these kind of situations with any kind of frequency or regularity, is that I think it's something you either have in you or you don't. You won't know that you have it in you or not until you're actually in those situations. Do you want to take a take a little Right, so we can just have a sip of drinks. You're fascinating. I'm saying that for you guys. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. The other thing we do to help us um, in those situations to prevent us from sort of going to custard when when all hell's breaking loose is it always, always, always have an escape route. Especially with fighting bushfires, and I, I acknowledge this may be a little bit naive of me to sort of to think this, but it's something that's given me comfort and um, given me uh, allowed me to be a little more relaxed going into these into these situations. Bushfires are very very different than fighting a house fire. In a, in a, in a structure fire, you're in compartments and things can fall down. Your escape routes can very easily get compromised. But in a bushfire, no matter how big it is, and I've seen like 30 meter flame heights. You can always step back. So as much respect as I have for fire, I, I, I'm in awe of fire, that explosive expulsion of a huge amount of energy is absolutely awe-inspiring. But I don't necessarily fear the fire because I know I can get away from it. What I do fear is entrapment or encirclement. So having an escape route is one of the things that is always, you know, it's an obvious safety thing that you, that you sort of drill into your crews. But also knowing that this thing could kick up, and as long as I can step away from it, I'm going to be okay, and then regroup and tackle it, and tackle it a different way. We're a community volunteer organisation, and most of the work we do is, is in these communities. One of the things that was really incredible about the 2019-2020 season is the amount of exposure we had um, with, with, with local communities not our local community, because um, Northern Beaches um, as a district escaped um, any major fires, as did pretty much all the um, Greater Sydney area districts. We got sent down that area. Um, on 31st of December, I was on my way back from Lithgow and Capiti up, up in that area. Mm. And as we were coming back, we were hearing on the radio all the emergency alerts and all the, all the um, catastrophes that were going on that, uh, that a lot of my friends were facing down there. Um, and a lot of pretty well-known stories that came from um, came from that that um, really horrific sequence of events. We were sent down to be there on January 4th. Uh, part of that mission was also just to make sure there weren't any um, obvious signs of loss of life, um, whether people were in swimming pools or in, um, you know, there were people who hadn't made it. So straight away we were in the situation where we were in the midst of this destruction. Um, a lot of the, you know, obviously they had been evacuated well before. Um, thankfully we didn't find anyone, um, but it was a real sobering reminder of what it was that people were facing. There was one woman who had lost half of her house, which is almost as worse than losing the whole house. You could see what was there and in the absolute destruction. Um, the rawness of emotion um, on display there is something which is really quite, uh, quite difficult to, to process and deal with. But, you know, we're the fireys and so we're usually pretty well received. On that day, um, we weren't well received at all. I went in, I'm the community safety officer and community engagement officer of my brigade, so I spent a lot of time sort of talking with, um, talking with members of the general public. So I was on my crew who was sent in to actually liaise with some of these locals um, and they were not happy. Now, 
I don't blame them at all because, as I said, the rawness of the motion of having lost your home and the neighbours lost their home and, uh, or the neighbours whose homes had survived, it was not a good time to go knocking on the door in an RFS uniform because, you know, they say we can't have a truck on every corner and we couldn't have a truck um, there. We weren't able to, um, whatever, the RFS's service weren't able to protect their homes. So um, we, we, we were not very popular there and actually faced some moderate hostility from some of the, some of the locals there. Now, when, when these major crises happen, when natural disasters happen, there's a tendency for people to have this idea of... Uh, it sort of gets back to our humans need the narrative, right? We need heroes and we need villains. During those fires, I think people looked at the RFS and say, "There's someone we can. They're, they're, that's who we can put our put our hope in." And it would choke me up every time we'd see signs put up, "Thank you, fires." And I remember, remember in the Opera House, they had up a big "Thank you for like." I remember driving over the bridge during that and just almost had to pull over. But it was just it was very very emotive. But on that day, um, you know. That day it wasn't like that at all. We had heroes and villains. The other side of that, you know, people need villains. They need people to blame. Usually it's the government, um, and you know that's a whole other, that's a whole other story. But on this day, we were the villains. And again, I don't blame them. I understand this is rawness of emotion, and this is the kind of empathy we have to have in these situations and sensitivity to those situations. After a little while, we were pulled pulled out after having a few conversations with a few of these um, with a few of these locals. And uh, we were to meet at, uh, at the, the pub at Milton. Um, Milton's just outside of Mollymook. And that was, where, that was our rendezvous point where they were going to give us, give us our lunch and whatever. I'd been really badly affected by, um, not, the, not that we were facing personal insults or anything like that, but this whole idea that, like, wait, hang on a second, we're not the good guys for the first time in this whole campaign. And it really hit me hard. And I don't know why it hit me so hard, but. It was a really devastating situation. We get back into the truck, and my um, officer in charge on that day had, had said to me, "Like, are you, are you all right?" I'm like, "Yeah, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine." That was just that, that just sucked. That wasn't that was not a good day. We get to the pub, and the rest of my crew went in ahead of me. I was the last to, last to walk into the pub, and I had my head down, and I was just despondent. You'd think this would be a good thing, but it actually made it, for me, a little more difficult. As the other guys were going in ahead of me, you could hear that the, the pubs often become like a little community hub, like that's where people go to, like, not just sort of have a drink, but sort of gather and share their stories and help each other out, and it becomes a bit of a community hub. The pub was really quite crowded um, with a lot of the locals, and as the, the rest of my crew walked in front of me, I could, I could hear what was happening inside in reaction to us coming in. And I thought, oh God, I can't do this, I can't do this. And I had my head down and I just knew that I just, I just thought to myself, just keep your head down and just walk through. Because as the guys went through, the entire pub stood up and started cheering. I gave a round of applause to everyone in an RFS uniform who walked in that door. Oh, geez, I'm going to talk up about it now. <laughs> I was so despondent and I knew that if I, if I was to lift, raise my head and make eye contact with any of these people, I was just going to lose it. I was just going to burst into tears. I was barely holding on as it was. So we walked through. It's not the first time it's happened. Usually it's such an enormous celebration and a moment of pride, but in, that situ in, the, in those circumstances where I was feeling so, so much, I didn't know what it was for. So I was just feeling, it was, it, was, it was a lot. So we go in and we have our lunch. We had gotten to know the proprietors a day or two earlier, and Holly, who's one of the girls who runs the place, um, as we were sort of on the way out, she goes, oh, do, you guys, do you guys need anything else? Do you need anything else? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I do. She goes, what can I do for this? Like, I just need a hug. It was that experience that sort of reminded me how quickly things can turn and how difficult it is to really make sense of these situations. I understood why those people were so upset. I didn't understand why it affected me so badly, and I also understood why the rest of the pub wanted to give us a, wanted to shake our hands and clap it and you know, give us a slap on the back. This is what makes this whole situation so complicated when you get to the end of it and you try and wrap your head around the enormity of the experience. At the end of the season, we had a barbecue at our, at our brigade. Now, most of the stuff I did was not with guys from my brigade. 
um, was with composite crews, other guys in the Northern District. So I actually got to know other guys from my brigade more than my mates um, who were with my brigade. And I was chatting with one of them, another senior officer in my brigade, and, and I, I just said to him, this is before I made the film, and I said to him, mate, I, I'm, I'm just, I just don't know what to make. I just can't make heads or tails of this whole experience. This is probably February or March at this point, so everything was all said and done, done by then. I said, like, there's just so much that's happened and so much that we've seen and so much we've done. I just don't know how to, how to process it. And he very matter-of-factly said, mate, it's very simple. Fires kicked up, we had a job to do. We got in there, we got the job, we got the job done, then we came home. It's as simple as that. I'm like, oh, is it? I don't know. I'm like, all right, all right, cool. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give that a go. I'll try that on the sides. Cut to a few months later, by this stage I've made the film, it's probably four or five months later, and I was down at, um, with a bunch of my fire mates, a bunch of my mates from, uh, from my brigade, and Ran mate's property down at Moss Vale, and I said, oh, you know, I made this little film um, about the big season. Um, I don't know, you know, if you guys know, they're like, yeah, no, of course, we'd love to see it, love to see it. I'm like, yeah, okay, it's only four minutes, and I just kind of sheepishly put it on. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Put it on. And there were two things that came out of that, two comments that I got, only two comments I got from it. The first one was, no, mate, we can watch that we'll watch that again. That was awesome, that was great. The second comment, was from a bloke at the barbecue. He said, we have a job to do, we've got to do it, we've got to go. And he, he just said, yeah, you guys go ahead, I'll, I'll wait outside. I can't, I, I, no, I just, it, it's great, but that's too sad. Can't deal, can't deal with it. Post-traumatic stress is, is stress is something that I think we all have an understanding of. We have, we have an, an awareness of it now. And it's something that does affect, obviously, people in the office. It doesn't affect anyone. It doesn't, it just, it doesn't affect everyone. And I'm happy to say that um, you know, for the most part, the dicey situations that I was in had a positive outcome. So, yeah, there are moments where it's like, you know, I'm maybe feeling a bit mm, about some of the experiences, but I don't feel like, I don't, when they're talking about post-traumatic stress, I don't, I don't feel like they're talking about that. One of the things that people, that, you, that doesn't fit the narrative is this idea that you know, the RFS it is mainly made up of, of guys. We do have a number of fantastic firefighters who are females and, and you know, love them dearly and have been in some hairy situations with, um, with quite a few of them and, and, you know, all of those guys. But there is this narrative that gets portrayed about the sort of bravado and blokey blokes and guys don't share feelings and guys don't share their emotions and all this stuff gets buried. And I mean to tell you now, that has not been my experience at all. That back seat of the fire truck might as well be a, psych a psychiatrist couch in a lot of the trips that I've been on. People on crews, in fire trucks, are so very open and so very vulnerable. And it's not just about fire situations we've been in, but people talking about the bus up with their misses or struggles they're having with work. It's a safe space because we're all there to look out for each other. And there's a comfort that's shown to the point where it's actually quite surprising to me. It's like, oh no, he's, he's really opening up. Like, and, it, and, you know, spending more and more time in the truck, you find more and more that, like, this does happen. I'm not saying it's across the board, I'm not saying it's absolute. But I thought it was interesting that my experience of that particular side of things, that that, that sort of machismo and bravado that sort of becomes a simply understood narrative hasn't necessarily played out with my experience in situations where people actually are dealing with, um, you know, ma major crises and major situations. I also do think that the, um, the Rural Fire Service does a pretty good job of looking out for us as well. Um, we have an enormous amount of uh, resources at our disposal. Um, it's, it's certainly, you know, and we hear about, like, our oh, so had to take had to take time off, had to take leave, just sort of getting their head right after mid-season or whatever. And it's not only the respect for what they've been through, but the respect for them standing up and actually acknowledging, like, yeah, no, I'm not doing that great. Um, so the culture... In my experience, the culture um, around PTSD and around mental health has actually been really healthy in the RFS. And I think for a lot of guys as well, it's, um, they, it's, it's a way that they can step away from their day-to-day -day lives and actually you know, be, with, be with other people who may only have five regulators that have any similar interest. Why do we do it after all that? So oh, that sounds too great. Oh, that sounds too flash. The money's no good. 
<laughs> Why do we do it? Um, a lot of us here will be friends with uh, Ming. I was having a chat with Ming. She was, we were texting back and forth just a couple of months ago. I had to miss out on an event that she was running because I had RFS commitments. And I mentioned that in the, in the chat and, and she, she said, <laughs> she wrote back, oh, RFS, do you enjoy it? Wait, is it, weird to, is it weird to ask that in situations like this? And I'm like, no, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, legitimate, it's a legitimate question. Um, and it's something we only really talk about amongst ourselves. Um, the public facing story of this stuff, it can be a little bit, it's very, very easily misunderstood. Um, Yes, I enjoy it. I love it. I, I really do. Um, and it's not only the excitement and the adrenaline, um, and that, but that's definitely a big part of it. Being part of a situation when you're act, actually adding something to other people's lives gives meaning and purpose to your own life. And I think this may be the same for all emergency service um, people who work in emergency services. I'd struggle with how to articulate this about any kind of enthusiasm for the work that we do because it's in the face of tragedy, it's in the face of loss, it's in the face of destruction. Bad things are going to happen, but when they do, I want to be the one who's there to, in a privileged position to be able to actually make a meaningful difference and add to that person's recovery, resilience, strength, we're in a position where we can actually do something meaningful to help, and that's, a, that's an enormously gratifying experience. There's a feeling you get from being part of an operation that's just so large, it's so huge. It's not just a couple of crews going to go and put out a fire. I mean, you've got these major situations that are going on. You may have hundreds of firefighters there. You have aircraft, you have military, you have... To be part of such a massive machine is an incredibly or our fine experience as well. The public support is a huge part of the excitement that we get from doing what we do. But the reaction we get from the people and, the, and the, when you actually are able to take a step back and have a look at the, the big picture, um, it means that what we do matters. I think everyone wants to be doing something in their life that they can have a tangible thing to look at and say, what I did today matters. And by extension, and this may be getting a little too personal, but by extension, by doing something that matters, it gives me the feeling that I matter. So yes, you're helping other people, but you're also getting a huge amount um, back for yourself as well. Um, Hugh Van Kylenberg is a guy who does these talks about um, gratitude, empathy and mindfulness. And the whole section on empathy is, comes down to a simple thing. It's about doing things for other people. That's how you get oxytocin. That's how you, that's how you get well-being. That's a big part of well-being. So being able to, and I do consider it to be a privileged opportunity, to actually make a, be able to make a tangible difference when people are having the worst day, day in their lives. Thinking back to that day, when I, was, when I uh, was considering and learning more about the Black Saturday bushfires and all the horrific, or horrific uh, lives of the lost then. And remembering that resolution that if anything, if, if ever I'm faced with a situation or opportunity to be in those fires, that I want to be the first one there, I want to be in the biggest past. That was all done before the 2019-2020 season, perhaps naively. And now I've seen a lot now we've seen a lot of the loss and a lot of the grief and a lot of the destruction. But perhaps surprisingly, having, despite having seen all that, my resolve is just as strong now as it was back then in February 2019. And it's because we're part of something so much bigger than we realise and that what we do does matter. And when people have a really bad day, more than ever, I want to be part of the mechanism. It's reason for existing is to look out for each other. In the same way look at, we look out for each other in our trucks, we look out for our community, and we all look out for each other here. I'd just like to leave you with this last thought. You don't have to be a firefighter to get that feeling. We all have opportunities in our day-to-day -day lives to help each other out, to look out for each other. Shane Fitzsimmons, who's the... Um, uh, the Commissioner of the Royal Fire Service through that big season 
um, and have been for many years before, uh, a, a fantastic servant to the RFS and to the state and a, and a great leader. In the film, A Far, a Far Inside, about the, you know, about the 2019, 2020 season, he was quoted as saying, if you look at any, any communities, successful communities, I can almost guarantee that at the core of what's, what's working about those communities is a spirit of volunteerism. It's the same idea about looking out for each other. It's about doing things for other people. It's pretty simple. It may just be holding open a door for someone, it may be leaving someone else going in traffic. But on a small scale and a large scale, we can all benefit from just looking out for each other, connecting with each other, and making a difference in people's lives, whether it's large or small. And especially if you're struggling in your own life and lacking direction and feeling rudderless and feeling low and get into those slumps that we all go through, find a way that you can do things for other people. And I guarantee you, you'll feel more joy, joy and fulfilment in your life. Thanks very much for your time. to um, help answer any questions anyone has or anything that, uh, that they, yeah, any, any feedback goes on. Thanks First of all, thank you for the work you do. The RFS saved my house about 12 years ago, so I have, uh, like, never any love for the RFS and um, the work you do is waiting. Um, I was wondering about, like, so the training that you undergo would deal with the, the technical aspects of dealing with the fire, the physicality of it. Do they incorporate into their training how to um, yeah, manage those psychological aspects, like trying to maintain that control over your cognition in an effective way in a stressful situation? Yeah, so the way, that, the way the training works in the RFS, you have your qualification courses, you have your bush firefighter course, which is, um, I think, over four or five days to be able to have your basic qualification. I don't know, if it's, I did mine in 1997, so I'm not exactly sure whether I remember or whether it's changed. I don't know whether it's formalised in that sense in terms of part of your training. But what it is, where that training does take place, is the majority of your training happens back at your brigade. So we, we spend a day up at um, you know, a day up at the station once every three or four weeks. Uh, for, uh, the duty crew weekend, and most of the time is spent training. Um, that's where your camaraderie and your, um, you know, your your brigade level training. That's where you get a more personal side of things. Um, and so that's where, like, you know, the stuff I was talking about, how do we actually deal with these situations and not, and not sort of fall apart when, we're in, when the pressure's on? That's where those sort of training scenarios definitely take place. And, you know, over the course of a career in the RFS, you probably have about 10 times more training at your brigade level with the guys that, you're, um, that, that you know and you trust and have a relationship and have a rapport with who are looking out for you and you're looking out for them. Um, so that's, that, 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 that's where it takes place. Um, and then on the on the other side of that, when things, you know, if you do that, so I was in a situation up in Port Macquarie in November of, of 19. Um, a truck had become immobilised and we got impacted by fire. We were there assisting. Um, it got pretty dicey, like it was it was pretty spicy that day. Um, once we once it had gone through, we pulled back and the whole strike team got together. The strike team leader got everyone together and said, right, we're doing we're doing. It. No one, off the truck, everyone, yeah. And then so we all gathered around. He said, right, everyone grab your phones. Everyone pull out the phone. Right, open your, open your contacts. Open, add new contact, add new contact. And he read out a 1-800 number. And he says, that's a SIS number, number, SIS number. Critical incident support system. If any of you have any issues from today or any other day, and it's not going to hit you tonight, it may not be till you get home, it may be in a week's time. If you're thinking about this when you're trying, when you should be going to sleep, or you can't sleep, or whatever, that's the number you call. Everyone make sure you've got that number. So it's really ingrained very much, not just from a formalised, from here's the syllabus that comes down from district, but in everything we do in looking out for each other. So um, I'm not having, I've called this before, I've not had to, as I said, I haven't had um, any sort of major. Uh, post trauma, but I, I so I don't have knowledge or experience about how effective it is, but I know that it's there for me and that gives a huge amount of comfort. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering about the 
Um, firstly, thank you for your service and putting your life on the line. Um, Thanks, mate. If you feel comfortable, would you be able to share any emotions you go through when you when you have no other option but to retreat? Um, let's get the fuck out of Dodge. Uh, yeah, no, I, it's, I don't mean to be glib about it, but when you, when you make that call, um, you know you're doing it because you have to. Um, so it, it, it's, it's almost sort of devoid of emotion at that point because the emotion doesn't, doesn't start flowing again until the adrenaline goes down and you take a deep breath and you just sort of look around and you basically go, oh, that was, a, was, that, the bad as, that was as bad as I thought it was. Um, so that, uh, the, and I think the other side of that as well, the emotional stuff kicks in when you realise like, you know, you've been working for a week on a fire and, but it's jumped containment lines anyway. Um, and there's all, and this happens all the time. We go on five day deployments. So you have a day traveling to the fire, three days in the fire ground, and then a day traveling home. What happens time and time again is that it's the week after you're there or the days after you're there, that's when the major impact is gonna, gonna, it's gonna happen. So they bring us all in, they flood us with, they flood the area with fire, so put in all the backburns and make the containment lines. Um, and then you go home and then you hear it's broken containment or it's held, like, you know, it's, you, the difficulty there is that you want to be there until the job's done. And these things go on for, for, you know, for months, as we, as we saw. So um, the, the, the idea of retreating, there's no sense of failure. Um, you get out because you have to. When a fire jumps containment line and you actually, you know, haven't achieved your objective, there is definitely a sense of um, disappointment and you wish you, you, know, you wish you could be there, you wish, wish you could, wish you could, wish you could, wish you could. Um, but uh, but no, if it's when it's a quick situation and, and you have to get out, and you just usually take all that you got out and take a few deep breaths, and I believe sort of settle down there and go on. Well, we have time for one more because we're very over time. So if someone has a question, then we'll, we'll yeah, do that. Pressure. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Thank you, mate. All right, great work. And on this note, um, have you ever lost anyone? Um, no, the short answer is no. Um, but I can tell you exactly where I was when Jeffrey Kate and Andrew O'Dwyer died. I can tell you exactly where I was when Paul when I found out that Paul um, Sam and Paul died. I can tell you exactly where I was when the three US aviators died. Um, I didn't know these guys, but in the the, the, the culture of, uh, and I would imagine all emergency services, um, but certainly in the RFS, the culture is that, um, you know, another firefighter's safety is as is, is important as your own. But the they, thing they, they drill into us is like the overriding firefighter priority is one, firefighter safety, two, safety of your crew, three, safety of everyone else around you, four, property, etc. Um, so when those guys died, it had a, a, a really incredible crushing impact, even though I didn't know the guys. Um, because, you know, you look at Jeff Keaton and Andrew O'Dwyer, they were driving um, through the Carol on fire, um, driving through burnt country, not unlike you, you saw in my film, and a tree fell on their truck, ran them off the road, um, killed the driver instantly, I think, and, uh, um, and, yeah, and, um, and Andrew shortly thereafter. There was nothing remarkable about that situation. There's no reason, there's not like they were doing anything crazy or different. Sam McPaul got, he was on the back of a truck that got flipped from a downburst. Wind so strong on a downburst, it actually turned over a, um, turned over a fire truck. You know, these, these things could happen to any of us. Um, so the, the connection felt with the other firefighters who died, even though you don't know them, it still felt um, with a huge amount of profound sense of loss because not only for the standard levels of grief that you feel for them and their family and everyone they leave behind, but it's the knowledge that there's nothing they did any different than any of us do. And when your number's up, your number's up, and it could just as easily be any of us. Big round of applause for Mike and Dr. Kashit Graham and Andy. We'll see you next month. We have a talk on relationships and different types of relationships.
relationships, James will be doing a talk on um, ethical non-monogamy and some others. So, um, yes, we'll see you then, hopefully, and have a good night.